I'm very excited to present our next speaker, who is a research professor for information visualization at the Potsdam University of Applied Sciences in Germany. Motivated by the design opportunities and research challenges arising from growing information spaces, he's particularly interested in the potential of visual interfaces to support exploratory information practices. Please give a warm welcome to Marianne Dirk. All right, thank you. Um, so I think this talk will depart a bit from the last two presentations. Um, uh, I'm, as Irina was already mentioning, I'm really interested in using visualization to support exploratory information practices for not just quantitative data sets, but uh, rich collections of data that may include text, uh, imagery, maybe video. And um, this talk is going kind of promoting, uh, so it's kind of here and there, there might be a tone of antagonism, so I, uh, hopefully this will not offend you, but um, promoting a, a slightly different mode of using uh, visualization to explore rich data spaces. So before I do that, a little uh, um, sort of uh, premise. Um, so if you go along, I'm going to use uh, the analogy of the city and how um, we are engaging with the city to talk about how we engage with data. Um, so if this is not too cheesy or too uh, cliche, uh, please let me proceed with that. Uh, the reasons are also um, that actually there's lots of um, commonality between cities and rich data sets. Uh, in the past, and, and still so in certain regions of the world, cities are growing in size. Uh, they are culturally significant. They have become the uh, cultural backdrop for everything that we do, and they are also struggles uh, in these places. And we can say the same about data today. Um, we have growing data sets. Um, they are becoming sort of the, so especially with social media, they are becoming the backdrop for everything that we do. Uh, and there are also conflicts in terms of access to data and uh, data poverty and so forth. Now, um, to Think about how visualization uh, uh, works um, and, and comparing it to the city. I feel that uh, most visualizations, most data visualizations, take an overview approach, uh, a, a bird's eye perspective on, on the phenomena that we want to explore. And I think that's, that's fine. I think uh, we have seen wonderful work uh, during this conference, uh, starting with, with a billion dots on maps uh, with, to uh, wonderful stuff today uh, by the New York Public Library. So I, I have nothing negative to say about this, but I would suggest, and I, I would try to argue in, uh, over the last, uh, over the next minutes, that um, this primacy and that sort of um, overview first dogma um, um, is maybe problematic for certain types of experiences and for certain types of uh, data collections. Um, so, for example, um, well, actually, first before I go into maybe the alternative, um, there. Are Many examples. I'm not going to go going to into these now. But uh, if, for example, the Ngram viewer by Google allows us to compare how certain certain words are uh, used differently or have been used differently in books over the last uh, decades and centuries. And um, so I've plotted here uh, the um, varying use of micro versus macro. Uh, if you pay close attention, uh, micro has been catching up uh, recently. Um, but these types of tools are very useful, very powerful, um, and they are sort of promoted um, and uh, yeah, they're promoted to sort of allow us to grapple with big data challenges uh, in, in the sense that they allow us to uh, sort of provide big picture perspectives uh, on, on these uh, data sets to find patterns um, and relationships across time, across space, and so it's great, great stuff. But when we deal uh, with, with data visualization in, um, in contexts, uh, in more cultural, uh, maybe literary contexts, when we are visualizing text collections, image collections, then uh, I think there's, there's some limitations with these reduced abstract views. Um, so some concepts that have been sort of uh, thrown around, like distant reading, by Franco Moretti, sort of a literary, sort of a macro approach to literary history, or cultural analytics by, uh, promoted by uh, Lev Manovich. So this idea that you can apply uh, data analytics to cultural collections. Uh, I think uh, these, these initiatives and these um, concepts are very useful. But um, I think, especially in the cultural sphere, when we're trying to make sense of sort of our cultural legacy and, um, and uh, trying to make sense of what it means to be human, uh, I think uh, they, uh, they make a promise implicitly, uh, and I think that's also the promise that visualization is making here and there, that we can see everything from nowhere. And here I'm citing Donna Haraway. Uh, she was uh, using that phrase uh, in the late 80s, 
uh, sort of criticizing objectivist, positivist science, where um, she was arguing, actually, in many cases, the more situated, more partial knowledges, the more partial perspectives uh, might be uh, the more uh, powerful uh, um, insights uh, to gain. Now, picking up on that idea of partial situated perspectives, I would argue that uh, if we want to understand the phenomenon, maybe we actually have to get closer uh, to the phenomenon. So here, a uh, few uh, um, sort of uh, scenes from, from Paris, I, uh, the, the first image was also from Paris. If we actually go onto the street level uh, um, of a city, we will probably engage more closely with the phenomenon that we are trying to understand, what maybe in this case city life is about. So, and, and this sort of, in, this notion of situated views um, is also implicitly also uh, um, um, advocates uh, movement. So you're actually moving between these views and that the changes that we experience as we move uh, through a rich uh, data set uh, is also part of the analytical uh, process. Um, yeah. So, and to actually um, make sense of that uh, and, and, and inform visualization design, interface design, I found the cultural figure of the flan flaneur to be quite instructive. So um, it was uh, sort of um, promoted by Walter Benjamin and picked up by a few, uh, loads of um, researchers uh, in cultural studies. The flaneur has been sort of characterized as this urban character who's roaming the streets and squares of Paris in the middle of the 19th century. Um, he, so it's actually a masculine uh, person, persona, so that's something to be uh, um, uh, closely looked at. But uh, his attitude towards the city, I think, is quite interesting. Uh, he is wandering around, um, not really with a clear destination, but with a very uh, expressed goal to uh, make sense of what city life is about. To, um, and actually, so the flaneur has been sort of framed uh, from different angles, but I want to take three uh, character traits, which I think are very useful when we talk about visualization. The first, the flaneur as a curious explorer who has uh, a great uh, sense of uh, interest in both maybe the shop windows, but also the side streets, the alleyways. Uh, and he's being pulled in by his different senses, smells, sights, sounds. And he's, he's open to actually change his path along the way. As he moves in that sort of uh, non-goal directed or this sort of more open-minded way, he also develops uh, his own pace, his own privileged perspective on the city that maybe everyone around him who is uh, just running from A to B might not actually have. And by doing so, he's also uh, portrayed as a critical spectator who outlines or who um, uh, actually uh, states where, where the issues are. So when, when the flaneur was coming up as a sort of as an urban figure, uh, there was really the alienation in the city, uh, mechanization, uh, uh, and um, sort of, yeah, negative side effects of capitalism that were sort of happening around him. And he was pointing these things out. And as a third character trait, he is uh, sort of working around these issues as a poet, as a painter. He's a creative pers person who tries to reimagine what city life could be. So in a way, he's quite paradoxical. He's quite excited about the city, but he's also uh, um, he's also taking issue with, um, with quite a few problems that are arising. Now, that's a big detour maybe. I don't know, I'm excited about cities, so um, I can talk about that for a while. But uh, let's come back to uh, data and information spaces. So to me, that, um, how, how the flaneur relates to the city, um, can be, we can use that to think of our users, the viewers of our visualizations, not around deficits, that they may not have a stats background, that they may not have, uh, or, or that they have information needs or knowledge gaps and so forth, but rather as people uh, sort of uh, in a sort of optimistic and idealistic uh, sense as people that we treat as information planners that can be uh, curious, they are pursuing diverse paths through our data sets, through our interfaces, they're critical, they question the visual representations, maybe also uh, the stuff that is left out. We had a great talk yesterday by Andy about the uh, sort of visualizing the blank, uh, the, missing, the missing values. Um, but uh, this, this notion, this persona, this idealistic notion of the information planner would also be a creative person. Uh, so she would actually contribute new types of content, new representations, new visualizations. So maybe I'm setting the bar quite high, but uh, if we design our tools for that kind of person, I think we can go much further uh, um, in, in, in sort of the reach and the impact that we can have with our, um, yeah, with our tools. Um, okay, so let's see. I'm not sure if I have convinced everyone if this is a good idea, but um, 
uh, I, will, I will try to break it down a bit more uh, to sort of what this could mean for interface design, for visualization design. Um, so basically, what I'm interested in is um, negotiating and, and sort of improving how people relate to information spaces. Um, and for that, I find explorability a very useful um, sort of uh, umbrella term. And it's, in a way, I, I would position that next to uh, usability. While usability is about the sort of fine-grained uh, mechanics of, uh, of, of the interface, the sort of user-facing interface, uh, I would say explorability negotiates uh, the uh, relationship between the, the searcher or the viewer and uh, the information space or the data set. And the three, and this is not an exhaustive list, but the three uh, principles that I find very useful in my design work, and I'm going to get to some of these visualizations in a bit. I think I'm doing quite well with time. Maybe I'm rushing a bit. Um, but the three principles that I found really useful are orientation, continuity, and serendipity. So orientation, this, and again, that relates back to uh, you know, how a flaneur might walk through a city. Um, by knowing where I am, and by sort of having a certain confidence that I would find my way back home, more or less, uh, I can actually be quite exploratory. So if we de design visualizations in a way that gives our, our, our users, our viewers, um, the, the uh, confidence in trying things out and actually making invitations to navigate, to look around, um, uh, we might sort of trigger their curiosity. Um, as we change things in the visualization as, as viewers, as we, as we change parameters, as we navigate, um, oftentimes these changes are abrupt. In search interfaces, it's actually still the case as you enter a search query and change it, the list will update very rapidly and you don't have a sense of what you have looked at already, unless you clicked on it so it, it will get highlighted. Um, the same is true just for browsing. If I go from one link to the next, if I go from the, the start page from New York Times to an article, there might be an overlap. The title might still be the same, but it's just perceptually, it's very abrupt. So in our visualizations, what I'm promoting is actually have more continuous experiences. So there's this, um, this um, perceptual notion of visual momentum. So if we have display state changes, um, can we actually connect these display states uh, that, we're going, that we're moving from if there's some kind of overlap? It's actually fairly easy to do. Um, and then uh, the third one, it's to be honest, quite hard to design for, uh, serendipity. These, um, these fortuitous discoveries uh, when we deal with data and information, um, then when people sort of encounter uh, bits that they haven't looked for, they, but once they found them, it, it actually was quite uh, useful or inspiring for their own work or their, their life. Um, and um, how can we support that in our visualizations so that people might actually move more laterally and not just target, sort of, uh, um, try to answer a very specific question? OK, so um, now I'm going to uh, actually move from this sort of conceptual, philosophical preamble that hopefully didn't uh, bore you too much to uh, demo mode, which should be exciting for all of us, uh, because uh, demos are always um, a risk. Um, so <laughs> let's see how this works. So I'm going to start, actually, I'm going to start bef now take that back, cut that from the video. I'm actually going to introduce that project a bit um, before I, I show it in action. Uh, Pivot Path is a, a, a visualization project I've done at Microsoft Research. And uh, the motivation here was uh, very tightly linked to that notion of the information flaneur strolling through data. And so we had the goal to uh, help uh, this sort of information flaneur relate the resources. In this case, the resources will be publications, academic publications, and the facets that are related to them, and encourage a gradual movement, a gradual pivoting through a very large uh, database of, of publications. Um, we started out with uh, just trying to understand some of the basics of that information space. It's a tripartite information space that has resources at the middle that, that can reference each other. Uh, then there are people involved that are the authors, and we have um, concepts such as keywords that actually portray the aboutness or topicality of these resources. Um, we designed uh, sort of very basic elements uh, for these different um, uh, entity types that have some basic uh, interactive capabilities. Uh, we arrange them, well, we give them different uh, sort of visual states depending on how you interact with them. Uh, we arrange them in a sort of three band layout um, and connect, so the resources are in the middle and now I'm actually going into demo mode so it becomes more obvious. Um, so the resources, in this case the publications, so you probably can't read the text, but that's okay. But there is text, that's important. Um, 
<laughs> so, um, so what's happening here is on the left, we have um, Mary Shivinsky. She's a Microsoft researcher. And uh, she, at this moment, at, at this uh, um, time in the interface, she's the anchor for that view. So um, the, her most cited papers are uh, selected, uh, and they're arranged in the middle uh, diagonally uh, in green. And um, the point here, uh, I mentioned uh, in terms of, sort of orientation, actually making invitations to go around. So everything that is on the display, before I tell you how things are arranged, everything can be clicked on, and you can navigate around these elements. So the, the papers are arranged by number of citations, something for some reason academics care about. But um, above that, you have the authors of these uh, papers, so her co-authors. Uh, and they are uh, arranged horizontally based on where the publications are. And that will become interesting in other layouts in a second. Um, but they are also uh, sort of ordered vertically based on their degree. So uh, as you see, for example, here, George Robertson, he's uh, uh, on the top because he's actually connected with quite a few papers. So he's a very active co-author of hers. And, and the same, we can look at the sort of larger, I also adjusted the font size slightly, uh, the larger keywords on the bottom, user study, information visualization. So these are important research topics for uh, Mary Shavinsky. Now the point is of this interface is that it encourages you to stroll around. So I can click, for example, on George. And as I click on George, the interface takes me along, makes a transition, a, uh, a stage transition. Um, and um, I, I'm sort of, I see, OK, that's easy. I can move on. OK, who else is doing interesting things? I can check out what George is about, look at his keywords, who is he working with. Um, I see, OK, here's an interesting paper, cone trees. Um, I can actually click on the, on the paper as well. Then we have a sort of bifurcated view that arranges uh, references that are mentioned in the paper on the left. So that's sort of the before part of the, of the display. And on the right, you have um, publications that are actually citing that one. So you have a sort of, uh, you sort of um, taking that paper as a pivot point, and you, you see in a sort of micro fashion uh, how the, the field has developed. So you see that Cone Trees has uh, taken uh, sort of inspiration or influence from uh, papers on input devices, um, inverted indices, case studies. And on the other hand, it has been picked up by uh, researchers working in the information visualization field. What is also interesting um, is that the main or the three authors um, that are shown here are citing themselves as well. So they have been influenced on you know, for, the, for their own work. So th that's something that's common, but it's also interesting to actually see that this is exposed here, that there's some self-citation happening. Um, now, uh, this is a web-based uh, tool, so actually there's not much graphics happening, to be honest. I mean, it's, it's text. I, I move text around with CSS transitions. Uh, I have as much graphics that I have is really only the curves that, I don't know if you can actually see them, they're really subtle so that it's actually not a very complex uh, it's, it's not very overloaded. It was intentional to keep all the curves fairly subdued until you hover over something and you actually see how they're connected. But So this is web-based, so I'm actually using the back button. And I can use it, so I go back to Mary Shevinsky. And I want to show you a third layout that this, uh, this prototype supports, the comparison layout. So here we now have uh, the most cited papers that Mary and George have written together in the center, so kind of like a Venn diagram. And then uh, a, a selection of papers on the left and right uh, side that they have authored without the respective other. Okay. There's a caveat to this. I come to this in a second, a huge caveat actually. But um, what is interesting here, so we now actually see, or we can see how the sort of social network on the top around these uh, papers that they've written together or apart actually unfolds. Who's writing with whom? And are there maybe people that they work only sort of apart from each other? So that's, that's one thing that, that you can explore with that. But you, can also, you also see in the, on the bottom that uh, there might be a certain weighting of interest, of research interest between these two people. So user study is positioned slightly towards the left because Mary has also been writing user study papers on her own, but George hasn't at least based on the sample that we have on, the, on display here. Uh, on the other hand, we have user interface on the right, so slightly moved more towards uh, George's side, and uh, it suggests that George maybe has been more involved with 
creating user interfaces. And this actually confirms what we know about these two people. Um, Mary Shavinsky is a cognitive, psych cognitive psych uh, uh, psychologist, and George Robertson is a software engineer. So they were actually sort of a dream team uh, for several years at Microsoft Research. Uh, she was doing the studies. He was uh, creating you know, really whiz-bang interfaces, and they were making stellar research. And that sort of role allocation actually comes out uh, in the arrangement of the keywords of the papers uh, below here. OK, so um, taking a breath. Um, so basi basically, that's, that's pivot pass. It's a, it's a prototype that sort of illustrates um, this notion of strolling through a rich collection. We deployed that for a couple of weeks within Microsoft. And um, there was largely positive feedback, uh, so mainly uh, focusing on sort of aesthetics, on the movements that are happening. Uh, there was some confusion or sort of false expe expectations because um, people were quite used to the typical search and refine model where you, uh, you, you enter a keyword and you try to just arrive at maybe one paper or something. So that tool didn't really support that that well. Something else um, that didn't really come up so much in, 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 the, in the feedback, but that we really grappled with uh, throughout that uh, project was that we were actually cutting a lot. So when I, when I select Mary, I haven't selected a keyword, and I did this, that purposefully. We are only showing the most, in this case, that based on the screen resolution, we're showing the top cited papers of hers, 26 of, in this database, I think it's a little bit under 100 papers. So we're cutting a lot of papers, and we don't actually give presence to these papers in that interface. So that was something we were sort of dealing with. We didn't, want, we, we, we didn't really find a solution within that time frame, but I, I will come back to that in a different project where we try to address that uh, to some degree. OK, so that's, that's pivot paths. It requires uh, a fairly well-structured database. But uh, I want to show you another project that takes some of these ideas of sort of moving around, of strolling, taking uh, anchors in, for one view actually from the data, uh, and then sort of take, so piggybacking from one view to the next. Uh, I want to apply that to uh, an unstructured uh, um, type of data, which is text, which you could argue whether it's unstructured or not. But um, so we, um, so the previous project was at Microsoft Research. This now uh, has been done uh, um, by myself and and a uh, corpus linguist, uh, Dawn Knight at. Uh, at Newcastle University in the UK, and we wanted to sort of bring playfulness and sort of exploratory playfulness to um, sort of uh, corpus linguist uh, visualizations to invite non-experts, non-techies, non-linguists to to play with their data. And so this is an early prototype uh, um, to manage your expectation. Um, so this is what happens, what it looks like when we uh, visualize the English text of Hansel and Gretel, uh, um, um, one of the famous, famous uh, um, fairy tales of, of the Grimm's collection. Um, so it just, it just starts out as a fairly mundane tag cloud, but it's an interactive tag cloud uh, that allows you to uh, actually navigate between different words. So we can see how words correlate with each other. So uh, when I just hover over a word like little, I can see that uh, little Hansel is actually often used in that tale because it's, it's highlighted uh, in, in bright pink. So I, I can then click on little, um, and it becomes a pivot point, uh, just as we had pivot points in the, in the previous project. But now I'm actually operating on the words used in that, um, in, in that, uh, in that tale in this case. I can see uh, how they are used, whether they are used more before or after that word. I don't do collision detection. I think we had collision detection uh, mentioned by uh, Mike yesterday. Not doing anything here. Uh, so you see th some um, not so fancy overlaps. Um, but they are, they're positioned based on whether they are used more before or after. And you can also see a sample of, of the words um, used below the visualization. So I can see that Hansel is uh, often used more or less before little, and um, um, and 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 you can also interact with with these uh, words below and sort of move move through that text uh, uh, word by word. Um, I want to show you an example. So there's also a little search included, and um, I've shown you two anchor views in Pivot Pass, and we've done something similar here where we can compare how the text. Corpus, which is a fairly small corpus here, just a, t just a short uh, fairy tale, but how th the words that are used uh, in, that, in that fairy tale, how they uh, associate with two anchor uh, words. So we have now children and forest. So they are, so I'm sort of taking actually data elements as my sort of uh, dimensions or as my poles, and I'm, I'm saying, show me all the words that correlate with that, 
and position them based on how much they actually are attracted to one or the other. The font size now is just the combined sort of uh, correlation, um, but uh, the positioning uh, shows sort of a weighting. So we see, for example, that uh, the word woman is used more often in relationship to children, whereas uh, wood and thickest and, uh, and Hansel and animals are used more often with forest. So you can get a sort of nuanced sense of how certain words are used uh, together. Okay, so um, there's uh, a bunch of options. So we actually have some NLP, uh, some language processing uh, behind that, so we can actually um, uh, focus on certain word types if you're interested in that. Um, actually, what is uh, maybe interesting when you're looking at Hansel and Gretel, that Hansel and Gretel are actually sort of overpowering the visualization, so you can, actually, you can throw out these, view, uh, these words. Um, if I can spell. So we uh, released this for several months, and we um, have a little feedback uh, mechanism in the tool. And we got actually loads of feedback from, from teachers, from language teachers. And they were interested in using such a tool in the context of language teaching, where, people, uh, um, where, where pupils um, you know, have a hard time sometimes understanding how, how certain words are used in which context and how they, how they could uh, um, use them themselves. And, uh, uh, they were thinking that such a tool here could be useful when we want to look at how how to use a certain word in in you know on the street in the supermarket on you know at a conference uh, with your friends. So uh, we are we want to explore that further how this could be used uh, in in the context of language learning. Okay, so that's that's Word Wanderer. It's it's online. Uh, it's not yet on GitHub, but you can play around with it. Uh, encourage you and uh, and send us feedback. Um, and now I'm getting to um, the last, and I'm running out of time, uh, to the last uh, case study to illustrate um, so this idea of, um, of moving between uh, partial situated uh, views, the more bottom-up approach uh, to data. So, um, so this is uh, monadic exploration. This is the, t the title of that, uh, the, of that project, uh, also um, a project at uh, Newcastle University. Um, and we collaborated for that project with the book team, uh, the, the team of editors and, and also tech people behind Beautiful Trouble. Beautiful Trouble is sort of a, a recipe book for um, creative forms of nonviolent uh, action, uh, sort of uh, protest and civic engagement. Pretty, really cool book. I encourage you to check it out, maybe through that visualization. Um, so the book is, from a data standpoint, it's really interesting because you, you flip through it, they send me a copy, and and there are quite a few books like that. Uh, you, on, the, on the margins, you see these sort of see also uh, references. So uh, immediately, as a visualization person, I say, oh, I'm holding a network in my hand. It's actually a network data set. Uh, we could do something with that. So um, what we want to explore, though, in that, uh, in that visualization, uh, to negotiate sort of the individual chapter, so individual element of a collection, and the whole collection. So, but in a way that doesn't end up in sort of only abstract shapes that give you sort of the, the macro view, or only the individual pages of an individual chapter. Um, so how we, what we did here is we create that circular arrangement with a search box in the middle. So I can actually start with a search if I want. So considering protest, oftentimes this happens in the streets, so I can actually enter street. You have to trust me that I'm entering this right now because I think it's tiny on the screen. And as I enter that, um, the, um, the relevance, the search relevance actually then used for the displacement around the circle. Um, so I see, for example, uh, billio billionaires for Bush uh, apparently did some street actions, uh, reclaim the streets, streets into gardens. So I'm selecting one of these because I'm interested in maybe reclaim the streets, has been around for a few years now. And now selecting a node replaces the search that I've done before. And now the other elements of the collection are arranged based on their attraction, based on their sort of affinity within the network. So the direct neighbors in the network are uh, highlighted in, in, with these sort of dark dots. And uh, then there are sort of indirect neighbors that have certain neighbors in, in common. And they are also shown uh, with their label, but in a more subdued and a brighter color. So we can get a sense, OK, they have some kind of affinity, but they're actually not mentioned by the editors as, you know, as directly related. So this idea of having a more nuanced uh, uh, sense of how one element relates to the whole collection is what we were interested in in, in, the, in this project. And now, I, I mentioned movement earlier. What was important here as well was that you can actually 
click on any, any element now in, in the collection, even something that hasn't been identified as a neighbor, sort of, and uh, uh, navigate around. So I can now move to balance art and message. Um, I can look at uh, theater of the oppressed. So I can sort of let my interest in that uh, collection drive my uh, navigation. Um, and if I, for example, actually want to depart from that path, so that path right now might look like it's all about similarity. Similar items are popped up. No, I can actually say I'm uh, explicitly moving to the periphery of that visualization that may have nothing to do or very little to do with the selection So, to, in, in an attempt to maybe avoid the sort of filter bubble effect. So that, that type of visualization would allow us to, to give the, 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 the viewer uh, or, or, or the searcher that ability to actually depart from that, uh, from that path. Um, okay, we have a, a legend here, so you can actually uh, um, filter out or add uh, different types. And um, we had that uh, also uh, uh, online for several months, um, actually in collaboration with the, the, the team behind the book. And um, the feedback from, from the book team was very positive. We actually worked closely with them. Um, we tried to also, I can actually bring up uh, one page here if I'm online. So we actually tried to um, use some of the aesthetics of that collection, the color choice, the icons uh, in the visualization. So it actually, uh, is, uh, it, it actually links to, to the content that is being represented. And, um, and so, so their feedback was this is, th this is like a wonderful new way of showing a, a, a table of contents. They called it a, a living table of contents. And the feedback from sort of pass us by, I, I don't really know sort of uh, what their background was, was an interesting mix of being excited about the content and being ex excited about the arrangement, uh, the, the type of visualization that we were sort of offering. And in a way, I, that, to me, that was actually uh, quite nice to see that, um, that the sort of richness and the sort of interconnectedness that the editors and the authors have put together into this book actually shines through in that uh, visualization. I think that's, that's, that's a, a good thing to strive for. Okay, I have one and a half minutes left to uh, get to, to wrap that up. Um, okay, we have that. Okay, I've showed you uh, three case studies, and I want to sort of bring that together and argue for that, uh, that visualization uh, doesn't always need to start with an overview. We can start uh, at the bottom uh, with individual elements, um, and I think a navigational approach to data can, 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 have, uh, uh, can have some merit and allow us to engage more closely with the data and the, the collection items that we are interested in. Um, I mentioned earlier three princi principles. Orientation, um, in these tools that I've shown you, um, I actually used the, uh, the data elements. I used uh, facet values uh, and words and, and the titles uh, of, of the chapters to actually engage with the data. Actually, I didn't show you much GUI. Most of what you've seen were, were actually data elements and labels, and they are used to then pivot through the data. Um, the display state changes were animated, and especially in the last project, these animations are meaningful. They're loaded with, uh, uh, to, to portray the difference between different perspectives. When I go from one case study to a, to a principle, actually the way things move in and out portray the difference in relationship. So it's not just, it's not just a sort of um, a tweening, but it's actually meant to uh, help you understand the differences between the elements. And uh, serendipity, in all these views, uh, there are sort of these tangential ways that help you to uh, explore uh, uh, different aspects of a data set and um, hopefully positively get lost and, and find your way back if you, if you uh, choose so. So um, in, in one sentence, so, I, so the plea or the battle cry that I would try to sort of convey here was, uh, let's take uh, data visualization to the streets. Let's look eye to eye uh, with our data elements. Let's not remove ourselves too far all the time with tiny dots and abstract shapes. I think there's uh, lots of insight to be gained uh, on the streets. So thank you. <laughs>